Hello, and welcome to Retention 101 with Janelle and Brie. I am Janelle. And I am Brie. And today we're going to talk about some of the reasons why retention rate is falling in higher education. So Brie, you want to take it away? So first we're going to go over the costs. And a big reason why kids are dropping out of college is because of costs. And because there are so many different factors coming in with the costs. Uh, One article from NPR.org said that Students are putting less money into higher education because they are trying to get scholarships, but when the scholarships run out, then tuition goes up, grants don't keep up, and it's harder to keep the cost of college down. Many families are having to scrape together money to be able to pay for one student to go to college, and it's even harder with multiple students to go to college. When I think about this particular... Uh, what. what Bree just discussed. Uh, I think about a lot of students on campus who talk to me about when they receive their scholarships, they want to go to financial aid and talk about exactly where their scholarships are going. Some of them can't even stay on campus if they don't direct the scholarship towards housing. And that's devastating. That can really deter people from wanting to stay in college. And it's even hard, especially with having certain scholarships run out certain times. You might have enough for one term and then next term the scholarship doesn't isn't there. So then you have no extra money. So you need to put more money into your tuition that you don't have. Yeah, so another point of this is that uh, federal student aid is, is, it's slowly getting increasingly more difficult to get. You're getting less money each time. And currently, federal student loans is accounting for $1.5 trillion in outstanding student loans. So we're, we're only adding to the economy in a negative way. And we have to think a little bit more about how we can start to consolidate the amount of money that we're using and we need to think a little bit more about should we really be going to college is this something that we really need or how can we lower the expense of should I stay at home not pay for housing you have to kind of gauge what you really need these times exactly and I feel like a lot of people think that oh I'll apply for 10 or 11 scholarships and then out of those 10 or 11 you might only get one and it's not as much as you need and that is always the hardest thing that goes into it you don't have that money or you don't know when those scholarships are going to kick in so that's really the kicker for most students you know the education foundation here at central penn college is a great resource if you're you know anybody who's listening is looking for money um i always apply and i always (laughs) i always win something um you know last term or last time i actually got a thousand dollars and it's a great resource and i think that but the thing is that one thousand dollars is not going to cover my housing one thousand dollars is not going to cover all of my classes so you have to kind of search online for all of these scholarships and it's hard. Some of them are scams. Some of them are just looking for your information so they can send you mail. So you have to be really cautious and it can be a real problem. Yeah, that's definitely the hard part. Like your high school guidance counselors might tell you, oh, go and try to do this scholarship and this one. And then you find out, okay, out of the thousand kids that applied for the scholarship, only one's getting like a thousand dollar scholarship. So it's hard to really pick which ones you're going to spend 20, 30 minutes applying to and which ones are actually worth doing and spending that time on. Yeah. And I again, also, I think that in high school, that's another thing is when we're talking about schools, a lot of times, for, for my school in particular, a lot of kids couldn't afford to go to Penn State. They couldn't afford to go to Rutgers. So instead, they were guided to go to, to community colleges, and that's the cheaper option. But you have to kind of gauge, am I getting a, a better education? Am I am I going to be capable of even getting into a, a higher college when I'm ready to go past my two years at this community college? Yeah, I mean, definitely even with just the tuition on top of that, you have books and housing and you have meal plans and other expenses. So, I mean, it is hard because you don't really project for all those and then most students having to get jobs at school or on the side just to keep up with everything and kind of mosey their way through. But Um, when I think about books in particular, I know a lot of students at any college, they just don't buy their books. And it's obviously a necessity for the classes. You have to be able to read your class information so that you can gain all that knowledge that you're paying for in the first place. But if you don't have those books, you're only getting half of the story. You're only getting what your professors are telling you. You need to be able to read and educate yourself. And a lot of students are missing out on that opportunity just because of the price of the books alone. I mean, I definitely get that. I mean, I don't feel like paying like $200 for a math textbook every term that you take math. But it is hard, and I wish there was something else, because those textbooks add up, and even like Central Penn having four terms, that takes a big toll when you're getting 
a ton of textbooks every year and it costs a good amount if you get them right for the bookstores so yeah and and reselling price is not helping at all either <laughs> no when when I was in uh, PTA I got all of these books about anatomy and all that stuff and then I changed majors and I became a comm major when am I going to need to know what the super scapular notch is I'm not gonna so I don't need those books anymore but I couldn't sell them nobody wanted to buy them because all these people are coming in as first year students already purchasing their books or if they didn't purchase them they don't want to buy them from me it's not going to be a better price hardly at all yeah and that is the hard part like you can even go on and try to sell them online but you never really get your monies back or make a decent price at least but they just most of the time I know my textbooks are all just sitting in my room because I can't sell them I'm just going to keep them there for someone who needs them I guess exactly and when it comes to um, jobs after school or you know if you're a part-time student and you're working on the side a lot of college students that are traditional college age are only getting minimum wage jobs they're not going to be able to pay for what their parents quote should be paying for you know it's it's, it's, it's difficult and it becomes stressful. Yes. It definitely is. I mean, you have students who are probably working 20 to 30 hours a week trying to make ends meet by buying textbooks and getting everything else they need for school. And then it just doesn't, it's not enough and they have to figure out other ways to get those income so that they can actually pay for the necessities that they need for college. Exactly. You know, some students are, are working three jobs, two, three jobs, and on top of that, they're writing their essays, you know, doing little assignments of Blackboard discussion boards. And even just a single discussion board can be a little bit too much, you know. But when it comes to when it comes to cost, um, tuition particularly is a huge thing I want to talk about. And one thing I really appreciate about Central Bend College in particular is um, the freezing of tuition. I don't think that a lot of colleges would be willing to do that. But I think that with Central Penn, they've realized that there's a, a need to do that. If you continue to raise tuition, a lot of people are just going to want to drop out. They're not going to want to stay here because they just can't afford it. They're only able to afford the amount that they came here for and no more and no less. So you have to freeze it sometimes. I mean, that is the hard part. Like I've seen students who are in their upper levels and they're about to graduate already and then tuition skyrockets and you have such a hard time paying for college and you don't know what you do. So you take out more loans and then by the time you're done college, you have all of these loans you have to pay back. And most times you have no income for it. It's so it, it's you have to weigh the pros and cons, take out more loans or take a term off. It's not an easy choice, but sometimes that has to be made when they keep bumping up tuition. So, yeah, when when it comes to cost, obviously, it's, it's very difficult to understand how much college is going to cost. You're unsure of what the exact prices are going to be sometimes they're giving you averages they're not giving you exactly the price that's going to be on the bill at the end of the month so you know apply for those scholarships look into those opportunities making sure to watch those scholarships and hoping that you can get them and that's all you can really do right about now so this is jen and brie with retention 101 this is janelle dulac and you're listening to retention 101 with brie and jen Welcome back to Retention 101 with Bree and Jen. For this segment, we are going to talk about personal and mental health. Jen, I'll let you start off. So I just want to talk about a couple articles we have here. So the first one is from HiredConnects.com, and it mentions that counseling centers are having trouble keeping up with students as student struggles and even dropout rates increase due to mental health. Now, I know that particularly on campus, a lot of people don't even bother to utilize the mental health services that we have. And there's also another article here that mentions stigma. Now, with stigma, a lot of people just assume that mental health makes you weaker. A lot of people assume that um, needing or asking for help is just saying basically not out loud that you're struggling and that you can't do it yourself. And that's not true. A lot of people just need that extra oomph to get them through the college experience or through the day sometimes. And a lot of people just don't want to have to admit that to themselves. But when it comes to keeping up with student struggles in bigger colleges with you know thousands and thousands of students who live on campus or, or just attend the college in the first place, you have to get on a wait list to see a counselor. And that's upsetting. That's, that's genuinely upsetting to have to know that you have to wait three to five business days just to talk about the fact that you're really stressed about a test coming up. I was going to say that that is very hard because you think about it like most times you see a therapist or someone outside of school and 
or if you're in high school or something, and you normally don't have to wait that long. You can most of the time go in and see someone pretty soon after you make an appointment. But, yeah, having that waitlisting time, there could be something urgent that you really need to talk about or you're just having a terrible day and you need someone to be there. I mean, your friends can only help you so much. I think definitely utilizing those therapists on campus or just someone who knows what they're talking about to talk to can really help in certain situations. I have a statistic here saying that 27% of college students have been diagnosed with depression. 57.7% of students have felt overwhelming anxiety in the past year. 39% of all students in the U.S. report dealing with mental health problems. And only 9% of college students in the United States decided to seek professional help about their mental health issues. I think that's a huge impact because you look at that and then you look at how these students are not only dealing with the stress of college, but then they, on top of that, have depression or they feel overwhelmed and they have this anxiety. Like most college students, I know I do, just brush it off and think nothing of it. But that can seriously do some damage to your mental health if you don't talk to someone or actually get the help you need. I am a huge advocate for going to therapy. A lot of people say that they don't need it. They're, it's only for people who have major problems. But in my opinion, if you go to therapy, you're getting professional help for the things that you need. You're, like you said, your friends can only help you so much. They're not somebody who's trained and how to deal with anxiety and depression. You know, you need somebody who's going to be able to calm you down, understand what you're saying, and be able to give you good advice or just be able to be a support system. Whether or not you have depression, whether or not you have anxiety, even just talking about the fact that your day was great with somebody who can tell you that's a great thing and that you're improving, then that's that's something to want to go to college for more. Hey, I did great on this test. Incredible. You know, you get that feedback from somebody else who isn't part of your life, the unbiased feedback. And I guess many people are probably thinking, well, what does this have to do with students dropping out of school? Well, the National Alliance on Mental Illness said that 64% of students dropped out because of mental illness. Of those 64, 45% did not seek help on campus before dropping out. So think about that, all this overwhelmingness and all this depression, and you're just feeling so down and you have that feeling to drop out, but not seeking that help first and just dropping out really kind of hurts and they could have been there to help you and you could have kept going and gotten your degree. But it's sad because not many people know how to go about all this and not many people know how to deal with certain things and friends can only go so far yes but you need someone there to be there to help you professionally and make sure that you're on the right track exactly and and with depression um one of the main symptoms of depression is hopelessness even people without depression still feel hopelessness so regardless of of whether or not you're diagnosed you still sometimes feel like I can't get through this. This is, I, I'm incapable and you should never have to feel that way. You know, some people of course are just not made for higher education and that's just the case. But with the people who are really here and really dedicated and really want this degree or really want a better paying job, things like that, you have to learn to help yourself. You can't just keep going through life without not helping yourself. So all these people are just leaving college because they feel like they can handle it on their own or they can't handle it at all. And that's something that needs to be addressed. And I don't think many students know that the overwhelming of anxiety and the having too many assignments and them just feeling overwhelmed, well, that's not always necessarily just about your assignments. You could be feeling this anxiety, but it be a completely different reason than what you're thinking. And going to a therapist and talking about that and figuring out, who can help you and how you can get better and how you can handle that stress is a big help to get going and go on the right path for college and finish out and get your degree. And undeniably, college is a social experiment. It's, it's putting people together, seeing how they interact, and some people just can't take the heat. It's full of drama. There's full of people, full of uh, people who want to emotionally harm you. You know, there, there's a lot of crazy stuff that can happen in college and a lot of danger that comes with it. So you have to understand what your level is of how much you can take. Because if you're surrounding yourself with people who are not ready to handle you or you're not ready to handle them, then it just gets more and more difficult. And, you know, you, you become a senior and then you're you're like, how did all this happen? Where am I? What am I doing with the rest of my life? You know, and, and sometimes a lot of time people leave during their first year. 
you know, and that's that's the big thing is that a lot of people leave during their freshman year because they're unsure of exactly what the college experience is like. But then you talk to the seniors and they're like, I don't even know how I got through it. They they're like half they're halfway out the door and they're like, I don't even know what happened. It was all a, a, a blur because they were just so stressed the whole time. Yeah, that's definitely the hard part. I mean, you have that stress and there's a lot of students who they go into college thinking, okay, this is exactly like high school. I'm just going to fly by. It'll be fine. And then you have other students who are panicking before they even get to college. Like, how am I going to handle this? What am I going to do? How is this all going to work? Not, And they put on that extra stress, I think, and that's what really starts it all out. I know for me, I definitely was panicking before I came to my first day of class. And I know some people were just showing up in, like, pajamas. Like, they didn't care. And I'm like... I would be too panicked to do that. Like there was so many things that I felt like I missed because I was so stressed out. And I feel like getting that help and talking to a therapist can really help you with that stress and anxiety to help you do better in not only regular settings, but also in your classes and with your friends and your professors. Yeah. And also I think that parents and tv shows they really hype up the college experience they're like this is going to be great this is going to be the best time of your life so some people even come in not necessarily stressed but they come in like excited they're like yes this is going to be my peak this is going to be the best time i'm ever going to have it's going to be so much fun and then in reality they're not prepared to actually go to these classes they think they're going to come and party they're not prepared to have to sit and study and work hard because that's what college requires And I think that's the hard part. Everyone kind of gets their own mindset about how college is going to happen. And some people think it's going to be stress-free. Other ones think it's going to be too much stress. But having that own mindset and then coming in and it's a whole different reality, I think that's where you get that overwhelming, like, side to it. And you just stop and you don't know what to do. But I definitely agree. I think seeing a therapist on campus or talking to anyone that can help is really something that needs to happen before anyone considers even dropping out. I think that should be like a rule for all colleges. I agree. I, I do think that it's extremely important to be able to to discuss those kind of things with somebody. So this is Retention 101 with Bree and Jen, and we'll be right back. This is Brianna Salsitz, and you're listening to Retention 101 with Bree and Jen. Welcome back to Retention 101 with Jen and Bree. Bree, did you have any pressures coming into college? I did. I mean, our high school guidance counselor was very adamant about every student going to college, whether it was community college or a private college or some type of college that they really pushed you to go. Was your school like that or completely different? Oh, definitely the same. It was um, my school always pushed students to want to go to college um, and even if they didn't want to go to college they would somehow convince them to want to go to community college to go and get craftsmanship sort of degree rather than a four-year bachelor's degree like we're trying to get right now Um, but personally my biggest pressure came from my parents what about you yeah I mean my parents and my peers I knew starting junior year all my friends kind of wanted to go to the same college everyone wanted to go together have the experiences together start together and end together And as we kind of got to senior year, that pressure was still there, but it was more from my parents my senior year to kind of pick a college, go to college, and that's the only option. So my parents were never married, uh, and when it came to my dad, he never went to college, and none of his family did either. So from his side, I was technically a first-generation student. From my mom's side, she was an educated woman. She went to college and got her business degree, and so my mom wanted me to go to college so that I can have that experience like she did. She always told me that college was going to be the best period of time for me because she knew I loved to learn. And my dad wanted me to go to college so that he can say his beloved daughter went to college. That's exciting to say. But when it came to what I wanted to do, that's where the difficult part came in. I wasn't sure exactly what I wanted to do, but there was a lot of push for me to go to physical therapy. And then I came here and I realized that wasn't what I wanted to do. And that that pressure is what made me think that I, that's exactly what my life path was destined to be. Yeah, this is especially hard. I know most kids start their freshman year and they're like, oh, this is what I'm going to do. This is what I'm going to graduate in. Like, they have no questions. They say, this is set, that's it. And then they start their freshman year or they're even in their sophomore year sometimes. 
And it's to the point where they're not doing good in their classes because they don't enjoy the classes. They don't understand the class, and that's not the major for them. But because of all this pressure, they went to a college they thought was the best for them. They went into the major they thought was good for them, but then it didn't work out. Because of all that pressure piling up, they felt like it had to work. And I feel like that's where the stigma really is in it all of these peer pressures and these parental pressures and even school pressures to go to college and they don't really help you kind of stay in college or even help you find the right things for you it's kind of just that pressure just to go you have to go and then that's it yeah and a lot of people who don't really understand the status of the student just assume that the the students are lazy or they're a bum you know if they don't want to go to college that first year right after high school they don't feel prepared enough or maybe they take a gap year because they just feel like that's the right thing to do when I say that I'm referring to the rhscommer.com article in which we found that information from a lot of people want to take gap years or want to just explore the world some people want to travel and a lot of people just think that college is the direction that you have to go after college and that's not always the case I know I've seen a lot of the 2020 high school graduates are really thinking about that gap year because most colleges are going online for this fall, and that's not how they necessarily want to start off their college experience with. So I know taking that gap year or even going to that community college normally wouldn't be okay, but in this instance, some people are kind of leaning towards it, and I feel like they still are getting that pressure of, oh, even though this isn't how everything's supposed to be you should still go you should still go fight out and make it work and no student really wants to do that and they're kind of getting forced to and it's not it's not working for them they don't like it they fail out they drop out it just it's all that pressure yeah and I I wanted to go back to when we were talking about school pressuring them I remember when I was in high school there was a project that I did do my junior year in which I described all of my plans for when I'm an adult and honestly I think that's that's wrong to have to do. I understand having a plan is very necessary to be able to, to succeed. You need goals. But when it comes to, when this project I describe exactly where I'm going to live, how many kids I want, what school I'm going to have, what degree I'm going to get. And not a lot of people, a lot of people had to make their decisions for that assignment. You know, they didn't exactly knew what they were going to do, but they had to make those plans then right there. Junior year is a time to be a student and a kid. You know, you should still be allowed to just enjoy life But when you're stuck with all these pressures of what college am I supposed to go to? When am I supposed to start applying? Do I apply for student loans now or later? Financial aid? What's going on? Like you you start to get overwhelmed. I know so many people just get overwhelmed in their junior year because the idea of college is all sudden. Yeah, I definitely agree. I mean, junior year for me was over the top overwhelming with classes and competitions and different things going on. And then on top of that, adding everything about college and like you said like the FAFSA financial aid all everything and I know a lot of students who forget about their college stuff and push it off until their senior year and that's where they really struggle with that pressure everyone's pressuring them to go but then they can't get into the right college it's not they miss out on like the Pell Grants and stuff so that's the biggest part where this pressure is just coming in but these people don't understand that it might not be the best for the student and having that pressure is pushing them in the complete wrong direction that they need to go in, which I feel like is why a lot of kids drop out because they want to go back and find the road they're supposed to be on, not the road that they were pressured to go down. Yeah, I I know a lot of people who end up going to trade colleges and things like that because they realize early or later that college is not the way for them. And I wanted to reference an article from SHS Centennial, and they mentioned that 30% of high school graduates make more money than those with a college degree. So I just wanted to touch on that real quick. There's a lot of people that I know who went to preparation high schools. You went to one of those. Yeah, it's. Um, I know I went to a tech school that had kind of, you did your high school classes while you did like a trade, and you kind of went through the path of trying to figure out what you wanted to do after. And I completely agree. I know a ton of people who are now welders and making more money than I will ever see being an underwater welder while I'm still going to college and racking up all these student loans. I mean, that's the hard part. Like, higher education does not guarantee a higher salary. It's Everyone thinks that, but then you really go into it and it's not, it's not what they really want to be or do. 
So I just wanted to say that, you know, if you're thinking about if you want to continue college or if you want to go to college, consider if it's going to, to positively affect the rest of your life. Do you feel like this is the path for you? Don't think about what the college is telling you, what your parents are telling you is right or your friends are doing. Think about what you want for your life, what you feel like is the, the right path for you, what you love to do. Yeah, I know definitely all of these people are trying to push us to do better and help us, but I think schools really need to work on fixing their retention rates and working on ways to solve those retention issues. I agree. One particular thing that I have here is monitoring milestones. And InsideHigherEd.com mentioned that this is a very important thing to do. Understanding what time these people are leaving or if they even get past you know, if they get past the first year, that's a major milestone to track because then you can understand, is it that the classes are a little bit too hard for these first year students? Are they not prepared to be in the college setting? Is it the faculty and staff that needs to be fixed? So, yeah. And I think even you said monitoring those milestones, but celebrating those milestones, making sure that the students know, okay, you went past your freshman year of college. That's a big step. Not a lot of students can often get to this point or you had those good grades and I think that really kind of helps and keeps students there because they feel like they're doing good and they are being rewarded or they're being told they're doing good so I think that's really a big step that colleges need to work on. Yes and instructors are a huge piece of that making sure that instructors are, are noticing when students are doing exceptional work celebrating their the feats that they get over it's it's essential to make sure that these instructors are accommodating for the students, understanding the students, and almost not becoming friends necessarily, but just getting what's going on. There's a lot of faculty and staff members who overassume and guess that these students are doing fine or that they don't have a lot of work in other classes, and that's just not the case. And I know especially making sure it's that first semester and that first year, because those are the biggest times when students are dropping out and the retention rates are skyrocketing. So really making sure that those instructors are really paying attention to that first semester and that whole first year. And then kind of seeing, okay, well, they're doing so well, they'll probably make it through, but still being there with them to make sure everything's going smoothly. The last piece of this, as I wanted to mention, was um, assessing current student needs. Yeah, that's a big thing, I think, because Every student is different in what they need and really assessing what that current student needs and seeing how you can help them in their college and their experience really is important. I mean, here, especially the advising center is an underused resource, in my opinion. The advising center is capable of telling you exactly what classes you need, or what kind of credits you're looking for, and, and they can really help guide you and shape your college experience in a positive way. And that's something that a lot of students need to to reach out for is that kind of help that kind of guidance yeah I definitely think if they start monitoring milestones and having all that then I think they can really start to fix the retention rates and really get those retention rates down and keep students in college so when it comes to retention rates it's honestly quite devastating to know that there are a lot of students who whose dreams are just not being met um, but we have to look on the bright side. There are a lot of students who do reach out. There's a lot of students who do ask for help. There's a lot of students who, who want this so bad that they're willing to stay. And like we said, we have to celebrate. We have to celebrate those students who are, who are really making it. But we also have to consider that those other students are, are not fulfilling their dreams and they're not fulfilling other people's prophecies for them. And that can be really hard. So yeah, there, there's a lot of things that need to be fixed, admittedly. And we're, we're here to talk about it. Definitely. Yeah, of course. This has been Retention 101 with Jen and Bree, and we'll see you again next time. <laughs>